Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Clutch the Moment podcast. I'm your host, David Steinhauer. Got a couple really exciting announcements for you. First and foremost, Clutch the Moment is now live on Patreon, Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, as well as Facebook and Instagram. So definitely drop me a follow and make sure to stay updated for whenever the next episode is coming out. I'm going to try to keep to a more or less weekly release schedule, so hope to see you guys again soon. Now, this one is a bit different. This episode is a really special treat. It's a interview I had with my dear friend Kiana Weltzian, who is a solo sailor. I met up with her just before she was crossing the Atlantic in a harbor in North Carolina. So I'm recording this on her boat, and if that doesn't sound like an ideal sonic situation, it's because it's not. Bear with us. I'm pretty happy with uh, some of the fixes I did to this audio, but it's not perfect. So it's also 7 a.m. We're just getting up. We're watching a beautiful sunrise. I hope you enjoy it as much as I sure did. Again, thanks to Kiana Weltzian. And now, without further ado, here she is. Well, it's nice to be here, you know? Yeah. Funny, we were just talking about this off yeah. mic. Right. Very mysterious. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is so nice to be here with you. Thank you. And I say that to every guest, but really and truly, floating here on this beautiful boat. It's very nice to have you on the boat, floating for the first time. Yeah. Instead of... In the boatyard. Right, it's kind of a surreal experience. Yeah. Well, welcome everybody. This is Kiana Weltzian. Where is that last name from? It's German, right? It's German. Yeah. Um, when I lived in Miami, I never really was into looking into what my name meant or any mm -hmm. of that. Uh, but a friend of mine was very curious about it and, and looked it up and Welt in German is world. Mm-hmm. And Zian apparently translates into some, roughly into like seeker. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> How could it be any other way? I know. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Kiana is the fearless, the unstoppable, the conqueror of seas and men. Uh, <laughs> Shucks. <laughs> Kiana is the captain of a 41-foot Warham catamaran yeah. built in 1974, is that right? Uh, 71, splashed in 74, so it was three years. Nice. Yeah. Well, luckily it didn't take us three years to get it back in the water mm, this time. Mm-hmm. Felt like Just it, half of it. <laughs> yeah, felt like an eternity. <laughs> yeah, so for the listeners out there, I met Kiana, um, Basically, by happenstance, her mom posted an ad in the Facebook marketplace locally. Hey, do you, uh, does anyone know of a dock space that my granddaughter can use? She's visiting me for, the, uh, for Christmas. And it's a picture of Kiana standing on her boat. Um, you know, I don't know where the picture was taken anywhere. Yeah, Honestly, it could who be. Knows? <laughs> uh, but she's like, yeah, she crosses oceans, but she's come all this way to meet me and she really needs somewhere to moor up and then you started having problems well you just started admitting that you were having problems basically yeah. started posting stuff on your uh instagram which is where's kiana about engine trouble and i said "Ooh, that's my in that's my way to meet this girl and so yeah we met at the boatyard and that first time, I honestly was a little bit starstruck, just because, like, you're the first Instagram influencer, quote-unquote. Oh, no. <laughs> or, I don't know what the word would be. But there's something very, you. There's something very surreal yes. about traveling the world by yourself on your own sailboat. Like, these people, it feels like they don't exist anymore. Right. It feels like that's just a bygone era. So to meet you and realize you're a real person and that you have such a similar mindset in some ways to me was like, that was really fun. Good. So. Yeah. It was a pleasure meeting you yeah. as well. And you telling me how to uh, pickle the 
engine? I can't remember exactly what we did. I, I think, think I had we, to clean out the We the cleaned the carb. No, before, when it was just over the internet, and I couldn't get the engine started, and there was oil in the back, so I poured gasoline yeah. in it, left it upside down soaking, <laughs> took it out in the morning. Yep. That was yep. pretty fun. Thanks for the guidance. Yeah, that engine didn't end up running. No. But well, it did. For a little bit, it got me to the boat that's right, yard, and that's then it died right, That's for right. <laughs> <laughs> it's just one more component that we switched out on that boat yard. Yeah. Was, I mean, what percentage of this boat was redone? Oh man. Eighty-five. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's rough to say because most of the um, just the wood of the hull is mm -hmm. the same. Right. There were large patches cut out, but. I wouldn't say that it was more than like, you know, between five, I would say 5% Yeah. really got cut out and replaced. Maybe 10. Uh, that's not what I meant. I meant... But in total, like, I mean, yeah, close to the 85 with everything being stripped and painted. Everything and got touched is what I was... Everything was touched. Yeah. By volume, it's still the same boat, but yeah. it's got a new look everywhere. Definitely. Everything was touched. Yeah. It's uh, quite different now than it used to be. New and improved. Rigid. So nice. Thank you. So, how does one become a solo sailor? Take me through your journey. I moved on to an incredible boat in 2016. It's a 75-foot Polynesian voyaging canoe made out of planked mahogany, everything lashed together, no screws. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. An incredible, incredible boat. And that boat taught me how to live on a boat, and it taught me the magic of living on a boat. It didn't t teach me necessarily how to sail because I wasn't ready for that, but it showed me that I, that's what I wanted. I wanted that freedom. I wanted mm. So this. you just jumped on this boat on a whim? What attracted you in initially? I was on a... So, okay, I'll back up some more. <laughs> yeah. Um, I worked in real estate in Miami. Mm -hmm. I wore high heels and makeup and suits and drove a nice car and had a nice apartment and was very aware of the fact that that was going to keep increasing. Mm. The things were going to get nicer. They were going to get more expensive. They were going to get harder to let go of, really. You know, just in a logistics sense. So I decided to leave and go travel for one year. And then I would come back and devote myself to working and eventually retiring so I could do nothing. Is my goal. Mm. I want to retire and not have to do a damn thing. <laughs> so I left to go travel for a year. One weekend I realized I didn't like backpacking. I wasn't going to like backpacking. Mm. I had just built a beautiful home in Miami. And I l really enjoy having a home and having a space and having my bed and yeah. having my smell and my sanctuary. So, but I wasn't going to go back because I don't like to do that. I don't turn back. So, uh, I found a job teaching English on a Fontaine Peugeot catamaran, which is like a white plastic mm -hmm. multi, you know, manufactured boat. And yeah, I, we talk bad about those people. We do. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, uh. And... Uh, I was with them for a couple of months. We sailed quite a bit, but I did not realize what we were doing. Mm. I had no awareness at all of the fact that we were sailing, mm. the fact that we were at sea, nothing, because there was an engine and there was an autopilot and there were buttons and you just kind of mm. do nothing and press things. It's very strange. So that, you know what, I, I can't believe I'm hearing this from a boat perspective because this, this is something that car guys love yeah. to hate on, yeah. right? Is the, oh, everything feels computerized, everything feels synthetic, everything yeah. feels like you have traction control and, and all these electronics 
getting in between you and the experience. Absolutely. So the fact that you can feel that on a boat mm -hmm. is so fascinating to mm -hmm. me. Yeah, I don't know. And maybe it's um, in some ways more intrinsic to feel mm. just because they've been around for longer. And we've been doing this sort of thing in for this thousands simple, of years. Yeah, in a very simple way for a really, really long yeah. time. It's not until the, the 90s that we got GPS. Right. You know? Right. It's wild. And now these same people, I mean, I totally understand. It's really nice to go out to sea knowing what the weather is like and knowing where you are. But these same people that spent years and years and years sailing with the sextant or different forms of navigation now solely solely rely on, on GPS. Right. And, and have forgotten what they knew before. And it's quite terrible, really. Mm. Hans... My partner, who has the the Polynesian canoe, he says that the teeth have been ripped from sailing mm. at this point, this day and time. Mm. There's no grit anymore. Right. The knife is dulled. Yes. That makes sense. So I, I want think a humans. Sharp knife. <laughs> right. Humans inevitably crave comfort, stability, and you don't seem to. <laughs> You, at least you define it stability and comfort very differently than most people. Right. You know, and it's a, a fierce independence that to you feels safe, which is, Absolutely. which is really interesting. Yeah. I don't know where that comes from. I don't know how, I think, you know, Hans and his boat and just seeing what, how much could be done with so little. Right. Really. It's not that sailing is simple. Because it's so complex. Yes. Every sail has three or more anchor points, yeah. and the tension on each controls everything, right? Right. You know, and, and just the way a boat is constructed, it's put together, and how you the, can repair it. Right. Where the center of the sail is, where the center of the mass of the boat is. Yeah. And yeah, it's sailing is something I love because it's so interesting and exciting there's always so much going on but also it's peaceful absolutely there's nothing else i can think of that is that combination of exhilarating and calming there's a, co a term i want to coin okay because i think it describes and i've always thought about it since i started sailing on this boat it's passive adrenaline oh it's, i love that yeah it's very very real Mm -hmm. I can be laying in bed, reading a book, feeling super relaxed, but my deep down inside in my subconscious, in my body, mm -hmm. I am aware of the fact that I'm floating in the middle of the ocean on this boat, whether I'm thinking about it or not. Right. And there's always that little bit of adrenaline, but yeah. it's, yeah, it's very strange. It's very cool. Yeah. I mean, it's life, you know, that that's, that feeling is just awareness of motion, and progress it's amazing and it's addictive <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is yeah it is there's a uh, something so innate about fighting for your life something so animalistic so human right so natural to to fight for your life to have a, an understanding that nature is more powerful that anything could happen and it's not personal and it's not under your control and it's not a, it's not caused by any other humans it's caused by you know the earth right and i don't know it's it's, it's very humbling absolutely yeah i remember moving out to utah about a year ago and being so enchanted with the fact that everything was massive yeah. and i was so small and some people think that's a threatening feeling, but I just couldn't get enough of it. I still can't get enough of it. That feeling of being put in your place. On the other side is, look how much more there is to explore and to see, you know. Look how the, the world is so expansive. And traveling in a sanitized way, you just don't get that feeling. You get, you get little doses that you get to prescribe yourself, but 
that's not what the world is about. No, and I think those experiences, uh, whether it be, for me, it's not necessarily being out at sea, but it's definitely thinking about what's under sea, under the sea, or in the sea. It's also looking at the stars on a very clear night. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's looking at grandiose things. They bring, they bring us, they bring me closer to God, yeah. to this, you know, all-encompassing, aw- awesome thing that uh is is overwhelming it is overwhelming yeah. sometimes and it's supposed to be yeah you know that's what makes it god yeah the bioluminescence last night was a great example insane it's crazy i wish i mean i actually i don't wish that we could get pictures of that i know when i when when i was swimming through and they were talking about the photos i mean there's just something so miraculous and so, so unique and special about that just the fact that we don't know that it exists Mm -hmm. most people even me i've been living on a boat for four years i've never jumped in the water at night and gone swimming with bioluminescence especially Mm -hmm. not with a mask on yeah the amazing part is if you don't move around it's just little flecks in the water you almost can't tell you know you look really closely and you see little little glints almost as if it's like uh like gold flecks in the water right but then you jump in, and your movement excites them, yeah. and and it's, I mean, it's just as anime as you can imagine. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> it was amazing last night. Yeah, little magical little things hidden all over the place. That's and true. if you, if you, control every aspect of your travel, you miss it all. Yeah. You know, the wonder, it's the sense of wonder. But yeah. I like control. <laughs> well, we all choose things to control, right? Right, so that's, yeah, that's yeah. what I was going to say. I think making yourself comfortable in in a way. I, I obviously run from comfort, mm-hmm. but I, I know what I need to be mentally sane, to feel well-rested, to feel healthy. Right. And that, that's my baseline. That's all I need. Yeah. From then on, it's, it's manageable. That awareness is priceless because a lot of people just err on the side of as much as possible and they don't really get to what's important to them because they are just showered in everything that tickles their fancy yeah so it's a very ascetic or a minimalistic life you have here on the boat yeah for in some ways but uh, that doesn't mean it's not abundant exactly i mean uh a warm shower standing shower like a normal shower that everyone's used to um you know i've gone a year without taking one of those showers i take my bucket shower and i love my bucket shower and i i don't need a normal shower but when i stand in one it is the most glorious thing ever (laughs) when i get to arrive on land and have an ice cold Mm coca-cola it's the most glorious thing ever that's right or stand in the ac with a little ATM when I'm taking out, it's the it's wonderful, and I am able to appreciate those things. Um, but just yeah, even if I spend you know a week on land, I get used to it so quickly, and mm. it's not a luxury anymore. It's not something to be mm. uh, yeah grateful we were, for. We were talking yesterday about how scarcity gives things their value, mm-hmm. and scarcity and abundance are not. Maybe I shouldn't use scarcity. Things can still be abundant, but in limited quantities where you appreciate them, right? Yes. Like, in a way, I guess that's kind of the nirvana, is is having plentiful and sufficient, but also being able to appreciate the value of each thing. And that's a fine line that you and very few other people I've ever met are trying very hard to find. Mm Mm-hmm. So talk to me about how you were not ready to sail. You said that your first trip translating with that family, you didn't really participate. Right. Your second trip, you said you weren't ready still. Um, I just don't know how to put it. I mean, uh, I was living on on Tong Java for nearly two years. And we sailed a bit, but just in Panama, not very long at a time. So my experience was keeping watch, and that's basically it. Doing 
doing what I was told. Pull the sail up, let the sail down, S steer this way, steer that way. But I, I didn't have a feeling for the boat, I didn't have a feeling for the sails, for the wind, none of it, for almost two years. And then getting my own boat and having to do it, mm. that's when I learned how to sail. So, I mean, the only thing I can do to make it make sense to me is that I just wasn't, I wasn't ready. Mm. There, there was something special mm -hmm. waiting. It's funny. It reminds me of when you're growing up, you think you know where things are, mm -hmm. and then you first get to drive, and you're like, uh, <laughs> help. You know, like you, your sense of the world is so different when you're the one actively doing it. Absolutely. And most people ease themselves into that process as slowly as possible. They decide, okay, maybe I'll take lessons, maybe I'll do that. And you said, nope, I am buying a boat. I'm buying that boat. That boat. And you had a checklist, right? You had a specific wish list. What oh, were yeah. those? After your time on Antong Java, what did you want and why? So, I wanted very, very specifically a catamaran. Mm -hmm. I wanted it why? to... Uh, because I had only sailed on catamarans prior. I have only mm. sailed on a monohull twice and each time for an hour. Wow. So I had only sailed on catamarans. And then my, my checklist was basically I wanted Antong Java. Right. <laughs> I didn't think that the, any other boat would ever fit mm -hmm. that checklist. So it was a catamaran. It was shallow draft because I had seen how Hans was able to maneuver his boat in very, very shallow waters. Mm -hmm. Also, just not having the fear of really beaching it. Yeah. You can push it off. You can, you know, you can beach it and it'll sit there and you can scrape the bottom, whatever. Mm -hmm. to play with tides. Um, and it just, it just allows you much more room for error, which I need in my life. <laughs> <laughs> in your uh, fail hard, fail fast mantra yeah. definitely having another hole to lean on is nice yes <laughs> yeah. and uh what else there was so catamaran black uh, oh black wooden yeah. right that was a priority not no? necessarily wooden just black it needed to be black and mm -hmm. i mean i could i could have painted it black but for some reason i was trying to make it as complicated as possible right and, um just and, for the sake of not finding this mythical thing yeah it had to be on Tong Java, or I mean, it didn't exist. Or nothing else works. <laughs> and yeah. I needed it to be completely modified, modifiable. That was the fourth thing. And, and meaning, other boats, they come with a deck, they come with a mast. They like usually, like if it's a monohull, many times it's keel stepped, and mm -hmm. you can't just do whatever you want on these boats. Right. Uh, so I wanted a boat where I could switch the rig into any kind of rig I ever wanted if I ever wanted to I wanted to be able to like change my deck and make this nice wood deck mm -hmm. I wanted uh just to be able to do anything to it and then one day on Antang Java we sailed into Puerto Lindo in Panama and there was a black catamaran <laughs> a warm ex like the the boat sitting under a tarp floating in the bay with a four sail sign on it and there's i mean that's insane yeah <laughs> that's providence right there there's no other word for it no it's crazy yeah. it is interesting how we we manifest things sometimes i have a very similar story about the porsche i have mm -hmm. i was looking for a car that was worthy of a more powerful engine. I wanted yeah. to do a crazy project. I was just in the mood for a crazy project. And I started with the Miata. I was like, okay, they're light, they're nimble. Um, you know, you could put a, a Chevy V8 in it. That's very common. Basically make a smaller Corvette, right? I like Corvettes, but they're plasticky. They're too big. Right. So, you know, something like that. And the project evolved because I realized... 
Miatas are small and, and light, but they're also really weak. You have to upgrade every single part of them to handle the increased power. So I started thinking, well, maybe I'll find something that can handle the extra power, but still came with an underpowered engine. And of course, those are hard to find, right? <laughs> what car has a really strong axle and gearbox, but a pretty weak engine? I'm like, okay, this is basically just the Porsche Boxster. There's no other car for it. So if I find a Porsche Boxster for really cheap, that kind of works, but is on its last leg and gives me an excuse to have fun, and then blows its engine, then I'll be happy. <laughs> it's like, cool, I have this dream. Yes. Uh, kind of unattainable, so right. that's good. <laughs> right. I'm like, okay, these cost ten to $12,000. I really don't want to spend that. I don't have that money. The next week, I see one for sale for $8,000. I'm like, okay, maybe I'll think about this. Ask a couple questions, leave it at that. Next week, it goes down to six. Oh. Next week, it goes down to five. I start asking more important questions. Next week, he's like, just come and we can make a deal. And I drove away for $3,700. Wow. And the car ran. Yeah. It didn't run happily, but it ran. That's crazy. And it was exactly, exactly what I was looking yes, for. Yes, you drove it around for a while, right? I did. Yeah. And I, I confirmed exactly what everyone was saying, which is, this is the one I want. Mm -hmm. This is a car that deserves that level of effort. Yes. You know? Just like this is the boat that deserves that level of Absolutely. effort. It was a project. Yeah. It was a year plus long project. And you did another refit previously, right? On Ontong Java? No, uh, I thought you refitted Maranoka. No, never. So I, I sailed Maranoka for a year and then I pulled it up onto a beach in the BVI because mm. I needed to paint the bottom. And there were all these hurricane wreck boats scattered all over the beaches from Irma, mm -hmm. which this Irma happened in 2017. This was beginning of 2019. So wow. nearly two years later, there's yeah. still boats. So you could be pretty confident that uh, you can just grab what you needed. Yeah, I went through all these boats, and prior to that, I had nothing on, the bo on my boat, and barely like any dishes or anything mm -hmm. and i these were people's homes washed up on shore that they didn't take anything out of so i got everything i needed and in that search i found a couple gallons of um anti-fouling paint oh perfect <laughs> so i was like okay well i guess i'll pull the boat out i pulled the boat out painted the bottom i was out for one week and then i pushed it back in mm. and pulled it out with a chain block Oh, wow. Tied it to a tree trunk uh -huh. and chain blocked the boat up. It took four and a half hours. <laughs> uh, and at the beginning, it was really fun, like, to position the boat. It was very, it was just, I mean, serendipitous, really. There, there was a construction site, like, a quarter mile down the road with these long tubes, plastic PVC tubes filled yeah. with concrete. Oh. I mean, it was kind of heavy, but not that heavy. Two people, we carried them down, and it was perfect because the like, PVC didn't break. Mm -hmm. And we were able to line this up, and they had these metal tracks, kind of like railroad tracks. And we brought those down and put them on the ground and the, right. and the PVC on top. It was so perfect. And wow. then I like, drove the boat, like, at, like, four knots onto the Ooh. beach and onto these things. It was so scary. And uh, the... I've only intentionally crashed a few times yeah. in various vehicles, yeah. and every time there is a split second where you're just terrified. Absolutely. You know? Even if you're fully intentional and you're just goofing around, or it's a piece of crap car you're getting rid of, or whatever, it's still like, haha, this is fun, haha, ha. oh this gosh, ah! This is not what you should be doing. Yeah, yeah, it's deeply yeah. ingrained, that reflex. For sure. But you powered through. Yeah, we made it, and then... Pushing it back in was a little bit harder, and I mm. remember uh, a, one of the PVC pipes slipped out from under one of the hulls, and so as it kept rolling, that PVC pipe scraped oh, no. all my brand new paint oh, on the inside of one dang hull. it. Yeah, it was really, really bad, but it was okay. And But then pr like prior to coming to the United States, I helped Hans redo his decks, not the top deck, 
mm. but the actual deck of the hull mm. the, of the entire boat two hulls 75 feet so all like that white mm -hmm. ripped it all up and replaced it with new plywood and painted it and so I learned how to use he did everything with a battery power drill no um, no no angle grinder no angle grinder and what's the S impact no impact. impact just a drill oh my gosh and a handsaw and cut all this plywood and did it all by hand so I was able to see like okay this is how he's doing the epoxy and mm -hmm. uh, putting the screws in in a very plain and simple yes. way and yes. from there I could complicate it so I was yeah. very lucky to have had that experience how is on Tang Java finished is it uh, just glass, or did it have that tar paper like this boat had? It's just planks with paint on it. Wow. It's crazy. That is crazy. <laughs> Good old wood. That's it. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, listeners, this boat, this lovely boat, was sealed with tar and paper. Nylon and then, sheathing. Yes. Uh, and then it was, yeah, nylon sheathing over that. And then, and then some areas were glassed over that, right? The it was like random. The bottom of the hull, so under the waterline, uh -huh. at some point in the last forty-five years, somebody glassed up to the waterline, but they right. glassed over tar, yes. <laughs> and yes. nothing sticks to tar. So that was very interesting to find out. And I had no idea my boat was covered in tar. I, I didn't question what it was. Right. I just didn't ask it, ever. Well, it, it was black. It and was black. And it was... you kept pushing into it with an angle grinder, and it was still black. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It was like angle grinding a street. <laughs> How many discs do you think we went Jesus, through? Jesus. Just... 200? I mean, seriously. Oh, at least. Seriously. At least. It was immense. I mean, what? Every we burned up has... like three or four angle grinders. Actually, wait, did we ever yeah. burn one up? Uh huh, a couple. We went through a lot of discs, a lot of sandpaper, a lot of. I That was one of the worst parts about it for me. Yeah. Was how much trash I had to make. Right. In that year. I don't think it was that bad compared to what I saw other people doing. Mm hmm. Because we reused sandpaper and we, yeah. like, I was very strict. Yeah, my you little... were circumspect. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, you want what? I, I want you to reuse this sandpaper as long as you possibly can. <laughs> I want you to but... keep all these plastic knives so I can stir my epoxy with them and yeah. reuse my yogurt cups for epoxy and reuse them over and over and over and over again. Yes. But still. Life hack. It's a lot of, a lot of waste and a lot of pollution that... Mm -hmm. definitely occurred but it's it's hard you know i'm at the same time i'm preserving carbon by keeping this boat keeping this wood intact i have this tree here that's... <laughs> yeah your boom is uh on that yeah right here yeah unfinished in all its glory you know so your one of your sponsors and one of your goals is the, the clean ocean project right right and Waste elimination and plastic reduction it is a big part of what you do. And honestly, I think it's very clear to see in how you live that that's not just something you talk about. You, you really put a lot of effort into that. Everybody knows that plastic is bad or that being wasteful is bad. What was it that made it such a big part of your life? Was, was it a specific experience? Was it like a documentary or something? Principally, it was crossing the Atlantic, the North Atlantic, in 2019. And I had heard about trash floating in the ocean. I had seen trash floating in, in the sea near beaches, you know, mm -hmm. in the Caribbean, and Brazil, and Panama. Like, I've seen trash in the water. Right. I got it. But I didn't. Until I was out there for nearly 30 days, and every single day there was trash around me. Oh, wow. In the middle of nowhere. And I am just a little tiny little speck on the ocean. This mm -hmm. this boat is not that big. For me to be able to count trash every day, just, I mean, imagine how much is out there. Yeah. It's insane. Vast. So that really, I mean, it was. A, I think it's been a slow change in my life. I've always been slightly conscious of it, but never 
knew really how to put forth the effort to make changes or maybe I just didn't I don't know I'm lazy but yeah just really living with my trash mm. when I'm sailing you can't just throw things away right it's very easy to throw things away and pretend like they disappear but they don't disappear and they will be here for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years every single plastic thing that you use obviously thinner stuff will break down fairly quickly but it doesn't go away it just becomes smaller and smaller right. and it it's now in everything it's in our blood system it's in our yeah. lungs it's in uh, the food we eat it's in the air we breathe in the water we drink it's insane and um and it's a, something that we've it's damage we've caused over a very short period of time mm-hmm. prior to the 1970s like there was a whatever people do there was right. plastic like that's not long ago and i mean seeing in single-use plastics is very very recently um so i think it's just as quickly as, as it was born and became what it is today it mm-hmm. can die and i think we can get past this notion that we need these things for convenience right because it's a dependence now it's a dependence and it's just ignorance and it's willing ignorance because we have the information and it's hard to conceptualize so much time because it's hard to think back to the 1800s that wasn't that long ago and to say that plastic is going to lo- last twice as long as that mm-hmm. from now forward it's too hard for difficult for people to comprehend but we don't need plastic bags in grocery stores mm. why do we need that we do not need that mm. we can first start with thicker plastic bags that can be reusable and you, you have to pay right to buy a brand new one 50 cents a bag nobody wants to do that that's right. stupid eventually you're going to go into cloth you'll find you, you know you have an old tote bag that you used for the beach we we can really one thing that i'm very excited about right now that i think fits in with this theme of what humans are capable of um i'm making eco bricks so Mm. i cannot i just watched so much trash come off this boat and when i was living alone on the boat i I was very strict on myself. I really didn't create that much trash. So the mm-hmm. plastic bag that I would take full of trash to shore would be every 10 days or so. And mm-hmm. whatever. I felt okay about it. Now I, I'm washing my trash. And I'm cutting up plastic and, you know, non-recyclables and things that won't break down. So anything with the paper with plastic lining or mm-hmm. aluminum with plastic lining and... Mm-hmm these things and stuffing them in plastic bottles and there are many people out there that are doing this and i think there must be a way maybe one of your listeners will know how to uh, donate these things if you don't want to build something yourself but eventually Mm -hmm. especially if you can get your neighbors to do it your family to do it you Mm -hmm. can build something really cool and i'm imagining an outdoor shower and you can color coat the trash that you put in there so you can have and you can make like a mural out of these different mm. bottles and you use them as bricks you know we're three people on the boat and it's been a week since mm. we've thrown away a bag of trash which obviously we're still making there's dirty trash stuff that it really can't clean off mm-hmm. and i don't want rotting away inside these these bottles but small steps over time yeah and I don't know how I got here. <laughs> I, I wonder every day, what am I doing? <laughs> right. But, but small steps are what got you here. Yeah. And it is surreal. I mean, just to be sitting floating here on a testament to that. Right. That small steps can make such a change. You saw the hard work and the long days. And yeah. The not knowing what's going on. But you just keep going. You just find a direction and stick to it until proven otherwise. Well, as long as it feels right. I, I, every day that I spent, it was 432 days on the hard. Not one of those days did I wish I was doing something else. I had many hard days, yeah. many anxiety-ridden days, but I never 
said, oh no, what am I doing? It was, oh, <laughs> what did I get myself into? Right. But not like, I never, there was no other option. There's no other option for me. Pause for some, for an ad break. Maybe I'll have a sponsor one day. That would be cool. There's no other option for you. Just out of choice. You decide that there's no other option for you. Or is it, is it now... It's a feeling. It's a, it's a comparison. I make the comparison sometimes. I envision myself in different scenarios. Right. And they feel good. But I can imagine myself a month or two into it being like, ah! Uh. <laughs> and so right now I know that what I'm doing feels really good. And I know that it will continue to feel good in the future. Mm-hmm. For as long as it does, and once it doesn't, you'll do something else. There'll be something else. Yeah, yeah. Some knowledge you have to act on. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. like it was that realization with the trash, or it was first starting to love sailing, mm-hmm. or it was you know these these moments that shape us. It's just in a way you still have a choice because you can always just go ah i'd rather be doing real estate mm-hmm. you know or i need or, to make money right make a change of some kind yeah. but you know at a core level that that is not who you are anymore absolutely and you know it's that kind of knowledge that in a way forces you to change because you know you're never going to be happy doing that again mm-hmm. you've found something better my mom tells a story that my aunt would always, uh, my aunt's much younger than my mom, and their family would go to a theme park, and my aunt would play on the rides for kids. And the time came, after a couple years, that she could go into the main part of the park, and she didn't want to leave the kiddie rides, because she had such positive experiences with them. And it's hard to leave something that's familiar and that you know is good Mm -hmm. but when you find something better and you know it the choice is self-evident you know can you even imagine what the next thing might be i really would love some land homesteading yeah uh it would be nice to also have this kind of transport form of transport in the boat yeah But I want to grow some food, and with this building experience that I had on this boat, I would really like to build a boat. I need some space for that. Right. But I would really like to build a little shack as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, yeah, I would love to incorporate the two things. That's my dream, and that's that's my what I'm working towards and my small steps every day I think I agree I think having the mixture of both it's amazing yeah I don't ever foresee myself having very much money (laughs) (laughs) but I would love to be as self-sustainable as possible and if I do ever want to go take a vacation and I can't afford a plane ticket I can just sail there (laughs) yeah (laughs) with all the vegetables I grew and the wind so and, and to me, that's a very rich life. I mean, last night you were here. That, to me, what we had last night and having everyone over for dinner and having a fire and cooking this amazing food, which is super simple, potatoes, fish, sausage. Mm-hmm. But there's just something so rich about it. Yeah. I think people fight. For that feeling or work for that feeling right. or long for that feeling and the new iphone 13 is not going to give you that feeling no you know no it's a very unique very special thing to be it, I, and again i go back to i think it's just very innate it's something very natural to mm-hmm. us and uh, this this world of technology which uh you know you're you're wanting to talk about how how technology and how machinery has made us better and how we made it and and how these two things have changed the human experience but i think the majority of our human experience 
has been, ah, oh, man. I'm going to say we'll edit this out in post, but you guys know that's a lie. <laughs> I think the majority of our human experience has been this very uh, a hand to earth, to fire, to water thing. That's what's real. Yeah. Tangible, palpable, immediate. But so are two-stroke engines. That's true. They are immediate. They are palpable. Tangible. tangible. Freaking A. Can't forget. Yeah. So exactly right. You know, it's not that machinery or complication is in and of itself bad. Right. Because thousands of years of wisdom has gone into the design of this boat. Yes. You know, it's just a product of a long line of technology. Yeah. But... There are ways to use it that enhance one's experience, and then there are ways that soften or dull or weaken the experience or cheapen the experience mm -hmm. is a better way to say it. We search for that every day. Yeah. I mean, I know I feel it. When I hear a diesel engine vroom, vroom, start rolling, I'm like, oh, that's such a nice sound because we're not going to hear that. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I know you say differently, but I think one day in the future, uh, you know, what, let's be conservative and say 100 years from now, mm -hmm. there will only be, there will be very few people who are still messing around and turning on a big old, yeah. Yeah. like, and it's, it's kind of like fire. Fire is obviously more common and more accessible and, but it will become one of those sentiments and we're just moving so much more quickly now right that these things that we will um appreciate in the future as as nostalgic and they're, they're coming yeah. and going engines are such a good example of a technology that doesn't need to be around mm -hmm. like electricity in a lot of ways is just plain superior but it is very qualitative it's very it's flavored right different types of engines or different cars or different machinery can have a very distinct flavor and and put you in a specific mood or mindset so effectively. And for the people that care about that, I hope they're always around. Mm -hmm. You know, just like I hope sailboats never go away. They're in some ways outdated, right? If yeah. you want a more effective, faster, easier, direct way to cross an ocean, we have that. Right. But the specialness of a particular mode of transport you know for people who actually care i hope it's always there i think so and i think it will be i mean a nice you know manual drive transmission and a really cool car there's gonna be somebody taking care of some old car somewhere a hundred years from now forever i really really hope so yeah uh they they will be very rare these boats, there were many, 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 many of these boats mm -hmm. around. Most of them that are this age are rotted, crushed, sank, mm -hmm. abandoned, forgotten. There are newer ones, but not that, I mean, they're going away too. But I hope that somebody somewhere will feel slightly the way I do about this boat and this, this history and want to mm. preserve it. You're not going to pass it down to your kids? You know how I feel about that subject. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe pass it down to your friends' kids. Yeah, I don't... I don't... I would like to not have it that long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd like to have it only a couple... few more years. Interesting. Uh, That's a very mature mindset. Yeah. I don't know. If I do, it's just a lot of responsibility, and I would like some more... I would like something bigger. I would like a different challenge. Mm. A lot of uh, people get married to their first idea and are unwilling to move on from that. Mm -hmm. But you recognize it for what it is. Yeah. And you love this boat. Oh, yeah. You, I don't know how. Okay. I don't know how anyone can care more about an inanimate object. <laughs> but at the same time, you recognize that it's a, a stepping stone. Yeah. You know? It's a... And yeah. it's... At some point, it will be someone else's turn for this, developmentally. That's that's my hope. Yeah. That's my hope. I hope there's somebody out there that... 
I don't know. I know this boat is not going to last forever. But with the materials, equipment, technology that we have today, mm -hmm. we could probably get it to 100 years old. Yeah, I don't I, see why not. I don't see why not. I mean, I, it's rare for the... I mean, uh, it might at, by that time be mostly reconstructed. Mm -hmm. But the spirit remains. Yeah. I think. My aunt and uncle met on a boat called the Amistad, uh -huh. which was a slaving ship in the 1600s or, or uh, 1500s or whatever. Wow, your aunt and uncle that, are old. That, yeah, they are. <laughs> The slaves revolted and sailed to freedom, sailed back to Africa. And then the boat was crashed or something. It it uh, it didn't survive, but historians rebuilt it. Mm -hmm. And they rebuilt it as closely as possible, as detailed as they could find in, in the history books. What do you think about that? Is that, do you think the spirit lives on in a recreation? Hmm... Does it have to have some link to the past that's tangible? Yes, I think so. I don't think you could rebuild it with nothing remaining of the old boat and mm. call it the same. I mean, you know, expect it to be that same boat. That's all. This is all woo-woo stuff, but there, there's something magical. And I don't know if it's just wood or if it's all boats, and, mm. but I'm very almost sure it's mostly all boats, but especially wooden ones and metal ones, um, there's a memory that it holds, mm. right? And I think as, as those materials do anyways, you can only bend them so much and so many mm -hmm. times. Very strange. It's very strange. And I felt it on Antong Java for the first time. I never felt it on the plastic boat, but mm -hmm. Antong Java. Sometimes I didn't know what I was doing there or why. Sometimes I would just be like, okay, I left my home in Miami. I'm on this pirate ship. I don't have a toilet. I don't understand. <laughs> like, why am I here? Do I need to be doing something else? Why does this feel so good? And the boat, it kind of, like, felt like a vibration through my body. I would, like, pet this boat, and it would just ugh, shock me, basically, mm -hmm. with, with this feeling of this is right, this is meant to be, this is what you're supposed to be doing, don't mm. question it, just this is it, this is it, this is right. And that was the first time I felt kind of like the spirit of a boat. It's very strange. Yeah. But this boat is very playful. Yes. I call it an old gay man. He's very <laughs> effeminate. He loves d decorations and... Um, uh -huh artwork and the finer things in life and good wine mm -hmm. but it wants to just play around and it's very lighthearted. yeah do yes. what, do do what it's meant to do but, I but don't have know. fun doing have it have fun doing it yes. yeah i feel that too yeah and i think certain buildings mm -hmm. can have that mm -hmm. that spirit or that feeling mm -hmm. and certain cars do too i think probably certain do. cars do too I mean, I remember my first car. It was a Scion XA, oh, a goodness. stick shift, and I changed the. Oh the, yeah, the, the, the shift, shift lever, yeah, yeah, shift knob. Um, and and it screwed on and off, so I put. <laughs> it was a uh, chambers of a revolver. Oh, uh, what a baddie. Yeah, it was. This and, is so Miami. And I had I no. I was know. living in South Georgia at the time, and I oh, had that's even more so. Black rims. And I wanted to put a black racing stripe over the top uh -huh. from the hood. What to color the was it? It was dark blue. Oh, nice. Yeah, it was like like navy gray blue. Oh, Kiana the Batty. And that, but that car, I felt like it had. I mean, it also. I learned how to drive again mm -hmm. in that car and drive stick shift, and maybe that's the feeling that I really get from these kinds of experiences because they're just so fresh and so new that I mm -hmm. feel like the boat is really teaching me or the car is showing right. me the way and what it likes. But if it's the same with starting an engine or playing around with, with an engine. Each engine is different mm -hmm. and there's a different sequence of things that you need to do that makes yes. it happy and you pull it. Yes. I mean, that's it's more than tuning. <laughs> yeah it's yeah that's like so specificity and that's so true and i would say mechanical personality the interesting thing about 
these wooden boats is there is not another one exactly like it. Right. There's no factory that this left. Yeah. There's no molds. Mm -hmm. There's probably some jigs, right, to get the measurements right and stuff, but, you know, there's so much more room for error in that. Yeah. Um, cars are mass-produced, mm -hmm. the vast majority of them. And... Uh, but the vast majority of boats are mass produced too. So that's true. I would say some aspects of the soul of a thing are built in. You know, uh -huh. some of them, like my Porsche, my Boxster, has the direct steering, has the smoothness of the engine, has that singing induction note, just like all other boxes, right? And that doesn't. That doesn't take away from it, just because the other ones have that too, right? But my specific one does have a flavor. Right. You know? Right. And that those kinds of things are much easier to see on a non-production Yes. boat. Yes, uh, and, definitely. And especially as they age. Yes. As they age and they wear in, and certain spots squeak, uh -huh. and certain spots are smooth, and you hit your head in the same place every time or whatever. It just, it takes on a specific feeling. Yeah. That's, you just can't ignore it. Right. You can't ignore it. And I think it's human nature to try and personify things, you know? Uh-huh. Oh, the sun is smiling at us today. Uh -huh. Things like that. But it's, it's traces of humanity. Right. In everything we see. Right. And yeah. that is how boats make us more human. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Listeners, please do me a favor. Follow Kiana. She's on Instagram at Where's Kiana? Her project, Crossing the Atlantic, is called Woman in the Wind. W women? Yeah. Women? More than English. one. English. <laughs> more than one. You're up to three now. Yeah. It's like it's like a snowball. Yeah. It's now just piling up. Lots of chicks on the boat. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of estrogen overload. <laughs> it's dangerous out here. I just got to say that. But uh, it's been fantastic. And uh, always follow those guys. Uh, Lerke Heilman. Yes. So I guess you guys can follow her too. She occasionally does some art, some illustration. And she is a perfect fun-loving, light-hearted. She's got this, like, gleeful, impish, you know, uh, energy about her and really balances it out nicely. Because yeah. um, I'm not like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're fun. You joke around, but but you're more given to be serious. Yeah. Lerica, her default is, how can I smirk about this? Yeah. And it's healthy. It's really good. So, and you, you have a third just joining you, right? Yeah. Alice? Alice Gire. She is a uh, filmmaker, photographer, young, fun, little elf girl herself. <laughs> yes. She'll be documenting our voyage, and we hope to make it into a documentary that hopefully most of you guys will be mm -hmm. seeing one day, somewhere yeah. easily. <laughs> Follow along. And you'll cross soon, so... If the winds allow. And... All right, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in. This has been Clutch the Moment Podcast. And I have a feeling I'm going to do a lot of work in post to make this listenable. Try and uh, mitigate as much wind as possible. But uh, appreciate you guys hanging in there. I knew that I had to get this one out. You know, Kiana's worth it. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Catch you next time. See ya. <laughs>